For centuries, human beings have gazed at the heavens, searching for knowledge and understanding. And as the ability to probe the far reaches of the cosmos has increased, so has our sense of wonder. We see a universe that is in dynamic motion. We see galaxies, collections of hundreds of billions of stars being born, stars dying, those galaxies themselves evolving. This is a remarkable universe. We can consider the galaxy and figure out how it's evolving and we can study the whole universe. It's just amazing. The universe is ordered in a rational and intelligible way. It doesn't have to be like that, it is. That's a fact that all scientists just accept but they normally don't question where it comes from. Science is an extraordinary way of exploring nature. And I'm never led, actually, to the view that there is a God beneath it all. Science describes how the universe works, but it doesn't answer the ultimate question of why all this exists in the first place. Human beings, I think we're always wondering where we came from. And the, the natural question is, what happened before the universe was here? The truth of the matter is we live in a universe that's very weirdly special. The source of that specialness we could call God. The God question is at the heart of an ongoing and sometimes acrimonious debate between those who see no role for God in the universe and others who view science as revealing the very handiwork of the Creator. Religious explanations, although they may have been satisfying for many centuries, are now superseded and outdated. Is there something going on in what's happening? Is there a meaning and purpose? Or is it just one thing after another? Is there a destiny beyond death? I think contemporary cosmology is not merely consistent with the existence of a creator. I think it actually is supportive. Religion and science are in a collision course. As knowledge and understanding about the cosmos deepen, beyond lies the biggest question of all. Is there evidence of a creator's mind behind the cosmos? Or is its existence the godless result of cosmic good fortune? Sometimes I'm fond of calling myself a militant agnostic. I don't know and you don't either. Every human being has a view about God, but as the debate continues, the popular assumption remains that science and belief in God are in conflict, a view heavily promoted by new atheists, a prominent group of writers and broadcasters who are declaring the supremacy of science and the redundancy of God. All those deep questions that religion once aspired to explain are now better, more grandly, more in, in a more beautiful and elegant fashion explained by science. They think that faith is a good thing in itself, a, a superior, morally superior reason. Wasting your time being wrong is the, the modus operandi of religion. As atheists, our judgment is that it's an, this is an old story and that it's time there was a more scornful uh, resistance to it, which there is now. Religion asks you to believe in a collection of absurdities what drives people to believe that there is a God is actually vacuous. With atheism finding its voice, a plethora of books and articles have appeared from both sides of the argument, hotly debating religious belief and the atheist claim that science has made God irrelevant. I think a lot of the atheists were just waiting for religion to wither away. Suddenly, the atheists decided we can't be passive anymore. We've got to become, you might say, a missionary atheists. Uh, we've got to proselytize for our point of view, perhaps for the first time. The new atheists share with religious fundamentalists the belief that their way of seeing the world is the only way there is. Now, science is a valid way of seeing the universe. Religion is a valid way of seeing the universe. And they have the difference between prose and poetry. So anyone who thinks only prose exists or we only need poetry 
is a fundamentalist because they fail to understand the many ways in which we have to interpret the universe in order to live a meaningful life. If I was a Christian or a believer, I would stay the hell out of this argument. I really would, because the more you bring it up, the more you remind everyone you've got nothing. Aware of how science is being brandished as a weapon against them, believers in God are marshalling their counter-arguments. Charlotte, North Carolina. With the rising voice of atheism in mind, 4,000 Christians gather over several days to consider how to defend their faith, a field of study known as apologetics. Apologetics, it's a Greek word that means a defense or a reason. Prove your case, substantiate your position, and you don't have to switch off your brain to be a believer. The questions have solid answers. People are talking about God because it's a part of the existential need of human beings to try and answer the big questions of life, so it's not going to go away. From my perspective as a Christian, it's obvious why they want to know, because what's coming at them is a big story that tells us that they're the end product of a mindless process, and there's something within us that rebels against that and isn't satisfied with the big story. And therefore, I think we are seeing a revival of interest in God because people want to know whether materialism is true or whether theism is true. We need information that has to be analyzed, and on the basis of that, faith is exercised. Is it reasonable to believe? We need to face up to the issues because truth is one of the great Christian claims. We're not wanting to spread a message of make-believe and wouldn't it be nice if... Islam also recognizes the seriousness of the challenge to religious faith. It's no good saying we're just going to turn our backs and refuse to engage with it, because that goes against the entire Quranic ethos, uh, which is to engage with difficult questions and to debate them and to search for truth. Edinburgh, Scotland, home to the biggest arts extravaganza in the world. But one of the largest audiences has been attracted to a debate on the God question. It's my pleasure to introduce the two combatants on my left, Dr John Lennox, professor of mathematics at Oxford University, no less, a man of science and religion. It is also my pleasure to introduce Christopher Hitchens. Uh, one of Christopher's tomes which touches on the matters that we'll be debating today is God is not great, a look at the monotheistic religions of which he does not approve. Christopher will propose the motion that the new Europe should prefer the new atheism. Uh, John Lennox will take the opposing view. Religion, it tells you that you are subject to a constant round-the-clock surveillance that goes on while you're asleep, it starts before you're born, and most importantly of all, goes on after you are dead. The fact that there's a God watching means there's going to be justice. I'm very relieved to be able to tell you that there's no evidence at all for believing there's any truth to it. The motion proposes that contemporary Europeans should embrace new atheism. But the question of whether it is necessary to choose between God or science is fundamental to the debate. God doesn't compete with science. Science didn't put the universe there, God did. God is the explanation of why we can do science. Yet constantly, the new atheists set up in Europe the idea that it's either God or science. That is a naive thing to do, even if you're an atheist. I don't think I need waste very many words on the forces that try to taint or pollute the teaching of science to our children by proposing the nonsense of um, creationism. And so this is a threat that demands a great deal more attention and understanding and resistance than it's so far been getting. New atheists have, uh, in a sense, uh, adopted the banner of science, and they contrast what they call the scientific way of knowing, which is investigation, experimentation, criticism, inquiry, with what they call the religious way of knowing, which is, as they put it, blind faith. Science provides answers this side of the grave. Whereas religion asks you to you know, bet on the other side of the grave. And I, I think that's a rather repugnant view. Florence, Italy. It was here in 1633 that a landmark battle was played out between science and religion. At its heart, the truth about the cosmos. 
it was a conflict that ever since has reinforced the view that science and belief in God are at war. On one side, the Catholic Church. On the other, one of the founding fathers of science and his revolutionary views on how the solar system works. His name, Galileo. There is a widespread perception that science and religion are at war, and there are some key exemplary figures. Galileo is one, and Darwin is another. The case of Galileo is a very particular one. Unfortunately, it appears to show the church as a dark institution. We have to be very clear why this case came about. What's going on with the Galileo affair is a conflict between two sciences. It's a conflict between the traditional Aristotelian science and a new science that Galileo is proposing. Galileo challenged the well-established science of Aristotle, that the Earth is fixed and is orbited by the Sun, a belief upheld by the Church of the time. There appeared to be scripture verses to support it. Wrong, said Galileo. The Church should have a new understanding of both science and scripture. The Earth is not fixed. It orbits the Sun. Galileo took up a scientific question, but then met problems, because he wanted to be a bit of a theologian. Catholicism reacts because its authority is under threat. But that's not a question to do with science and religion, that's a question to do with the politics and, and authority. For his impertinence, the church placed Galileo under house arrest. 450 years later, he remains a powerful symbol of how religion could suppress science. Embarrassing for the church, but not its claimed typical. From a scientific point of view, the church made a mistake. There's much more openness in the church now, including how we interpret scripture. The church and the science both look for truth. The famous argument in 17th century Florence was about science and about scripture. It was not about God. The belief that there is a higher power influencing human destiny stretches back for millennia. Ancient Greeks and Romans built temples for their gods, believing them responsible for all the moods and actions of nature. Deities, or the deity, was the best explanation for lightning, for the weather, for all sorts of things for which nobody uses those explanations anymore because we have one. That's the history of mysteries. They get solved by science. The gap goes away. The religious explanation that used to fill the gap disappears. Nobody makes the explanation anymore. And, uh, and that's the fate of it. The new atheists, of course, will home in on this uh, very lowbrow form of God, the, the God of the gaps, the miracle-working cosmic magician, uh, because it's such an easy target. But if you talk to serious theologians who've studied the sciences, then that's not, not what they mean by God. The crumbling pillars and stones of ancient Greece, symbols of a religious mythology that was shattered by rational thinking. This culture that worshipped imagined gods also produced Socrates, Plato and Aristotle. Science was born and mythology eventually disintegrated. In contrast to the dethroned gods of ancient Greece and Rome, the god of the Jews, Christians and Muslims not only survives but continues to be celebrated and worshipped. Why has this god survived? I don't find it the least bit strange that we're still talking about God simply because modern science as we know it arose in the 16th and 17th centuries. And I would want to argue that the motor that drove its rise was in fact belief in a creator God. This is a God who transcends the universe, who designed and created the universe. And that actually was the precondition of science because you removed the veil of myth. You saw the whole of creation as the intelligible work of a single creative will. And therefore, Abrahamic monotheism is compatible with science and indeed led to science in a way that ancient mythology conflicted with science. So as soon as you have science, you get rid of myth. 
it was the world of Islam which uh, really was the torchbearer of science. In fact, it was the Quran which uh, inspired all these Muslim scientists uh, for centuries to read and reflect, what the Quran said repeatedly, uh, re reflect on, on the universe around you and you will see signs of God in that. The alternative, God or science, is a false alternative logically. Newton, for instance, when he discovered his law of gravitation, he didn't say, marvelous, now I understand how the universe works, I don't need God. He did the exact opposite. He said, what a marvelous God who did it that way. Most of the great scientists of the past 200 years have been not only believers in God, uh, but most of them have been uh, explicitly Christian. For believers, science is a wonderful way of understanding God's work, of seeing the majesty and beauty of God in, in the universe. What science has now achieved is an emancipation from that impulse to attribute these things to a creator. And it's a major emancipation. Science is the most hostile context in which uh, to try to maintain these, these beliefs about God. At the heart of the current debate is whether science shatters belief in the creator or provides powerful evidence for his existence. To investigate, we journey into the cosmos to ask, in the light of all that science has discovered, if there's space for God. Is something out there? Maybe. How would we discern that? What kinds of experiments could we run to get at an answer? Till the early 20th century, when astronomers looked out at the universe, they believed it had always been there. Apparently, they were wrong. Now science has unraveled a different and spectacular story, beginning 13.7 billion years ago with an extraordinary event. The Big Bang. The universe started, first of all, with the Big Bang, which was this hot and very dense state. Scientists have concluded that before the Big Bang, everything that would ever be in our universe was crammed into an invisible, infinitesimal dot. Everything in our universe was wrapped up in this very small place, and then it grew. Was it chance? Was it God? Or was it an unknown law of science? That dot exploded. The Big Bang Theory is as certain as anything in science. I suppose nothing in science is ever mathematically certain, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. But it is the kind of certainty that simply makes it not worthwhile considering alternatives. In terms of where the Big Bang came from or what started it, what powered it, we don't know. And that really is genuinely difficult. Uh, we don't know. We understand, essentially, biology. We don't understand cosmology. In a sense, we could say cosmology is waiting for its Darwin. A further mystery perplexing scientists is why, from the first seconds after the Big Bang, order began to emerge from what could have been complete chaos. It was a big mystery as to how the Big Bang went bang and produced such order in the universe. Because if you put a stick of dynamite in a pile of bricks, bang, you've got a total mess. In this newly born universe, the laws of physics went immediately to work producing chemical elements that laid the foundations for life. Within three minutes, there was helium and hydrogen, vital for the development of stars. With stars, there can be light. With hydrogen, there could be water. With water, there could be life. What you see is something which is almost completely featureless, just hot gas, and yet now we have the extraordinary richness and diversity uh, of the galaxies and the stars, and all of this has developed since. If life as we know it was ever to exist, the elements formed in the early universe needed to be in the right balance. In the case of helium and hydrogen, somehow that was the result of split-second timing. If, in fact, the elements had formed not at the end of three minutes, but at the end of 30 seconds, 
then the universe would start at its almost pure helium with very little hydrogen. Now hydrogen is pretty important to us. Would the little bit of hydrogen left be enough to allow for the existence of life? I don't know. I mean, it would be a very different universe. The universe continued its spectacular and orderly development. Out of the gas and dust left over from the Big Bang, stars and planets began to form. This happened much later. This was when the universe was already maybe 100 million, 200 million years old. You have a lot of gas and dust that's rolling together, and somehow it is collapsing under its own gravitational pull. The dust is actually a bit like the dust you have at home, a little bit finer particles, but they are particles that still contain carbon, silicon, and so on. You can have the dust and gas collapsing, and at the center of that, you're building basically a baby star. As the star is born, it begins to rotate, and the whole cloud of gas and dust can collapse down into a disk. We think that happened with our solar system. The planets would form inside this disk. As the sun formed, it absorbed 99% of the gas and dust around it. From what remained, rock-like bodies created in the heat began to form. Our solar system came into being and took its place in the galaxy we call the Milky Way. A galaxy is a collection of about 100 billion stars like the sun. Each dot is a star. So if you imagine that one of those dots is the sun, then you can see we are very, very tiny with respect to the size of that galaxy. There are about 200 billion galaxies in our observable universe. Out there in a spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy is the solar system. And a tiny speck within it is planet Earth, from where we, the only known inhabitants of the whole universe, can investigate the questions how and why. I personally am convinced that the universe is about something, that it is not just an arbitrary and meaningless jumble of, of events and, and processes. I really do think there is a coherent scheme of things. You can't be a scientist without believing that there is a hidden level of order. I think it's one of the biggest questions of all, and I think it's quite right that people spend a lot of time sort of thinking about it. It seems to me that the answer is quite clear that they should come to, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, I think people have to work it through for themselves. For life as we know it to develop anywhere in this vast universe, the right chemistry is needed, especially basic building blocks such as carbon and nitrogen. There is a surprising source. The atoms in your body and mine were born in the middle of stars, which is kind of a strange thing to think about when we've always lived here on Earth. And in order for those atoms to become human beings, they have to have been thrown out of those stars. Some stars reaching the end of their life climax in a massive explosion so powerful that the chemical elements manufactured in the star are widely propelled across a vast expanse of space. Our universe has become a cosmic factory, manufacturing elements, many of which are necessary for life itself. But the emergence of life on Earth was dependent upon other crucial factors. Earth, for some reason, found itself at a distance from the star, in this case the sun, that was such that it allowed for liquid water to exist on its surface. Because you see, if the planet is too close, then it's too hot and you don't have liquid water. If the planet is too far, then it's too cold and everything freezes. Our 
Our existence on Earth has an astonishing history. A universe from an unexplained explosion, stars manufacturing and distributing essential chemical elements, one planet ideally placed for the emergence of life with human beings capable of debating whether we are the products of chance or the intention of a creator. Particle physicist and Anglican priest Sir John Polkinghorne believes the way that life on Earth emerged from the Big Bang is of great significance to the God question. It started 13.7 billion years ago as just an expanding ball of energy. Now that world has turned into something rich and variegated with human beings, perhaps the most interesting consequences of its long history that we know about. But it does raise the question, is that just a bit of luck? or is there something going on in cosmic history? What's the significance of human beings in such a vast cosmos? Are we simply specks of dust? Or is there something quite different and special about human beings? Do we live in a universe that's, uh, that's about something? Do human lives have meaning beyond the daily realm? Why does the universe seem so balanced for life to exist? If you were religious, you would say, God caused it. And that would be a satisfactory religious explanation. But science uh, won't take that glib and clearly vacuous explanation. I think that when the atheists claim that science is the way to figure out what's true, uh, they haven't investigated the prior question, which is, what can science know? and what is beyond the domain of science. Right off the bat, why would a deity make a universe that's 13.7 billion light years in radius, in, in which practically none of it is usable? It's just a waste of stuff. Why would a deity do that? It is the most wasteful uh, and painfully wasteful system we could possibly devise. Nowhere in that mayhem is there the suggestion that man is somehow central? It's not a waste of space, uh, but it is important uh, for our survival to have something like the planet Jupiter, a thousand times bigger than the Earth, uh, about half a billion miles away. We know that the gravity of, of the planet Jupiter sweeps up comets, meteorites, and all kinds of other debris which uh, could possibly destroy the Earth if it was uh, to collide with us, for example. Every few seconds, uh, galaxies we don't We've never had a chance to explore or find out about. Uh, go whirling out into nothing. So a lot of nothingness is coming to us. A whole lot of nothing is coming. Whose plan is that? Whose design is that? If the universe did have an absolute beginning, then since something cannot come out of nothing, since being does not come from non-being, there must exist some sort of transcendent cause which brought the universe into existence. And this is the traditional concept of what theists have meant by God. We have to wait for a non-theistic explanation. Very often you have to wait a long time. But that's what science is. Science is looking for non-theistic explanations of what we see in nature. It's hard for us mortal beings to get our minds around, but of course, if you posit a God that started it, I can just say, but w who created God? The question, who made God, is actually an illogical question. And uh, unfortunately, some of our greatest scientists fall into that trap. So uh, Professor Stephen Hawking, who is one of my teachers, asks, uh, who created the creator? God is uncreated. God is a creator and uncreated himself. And, and therefore, it is illogical to say, who created the uncreated. Part of the idea of God is God is a being who exists without being explained by anything outside of God himself. The concept of God is, is something so majestic and so beyond uh, human logic that we must be very careful not to fall for simplistic questions like that. And if you say, well, God is that which does not need to be created, why can't the universe be that which does not need to be created? to be created. For centuries, they believed there was no beginning. The Bible had been saying it for millennia. 
in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. I find it deeply unimpressive. And there are only two possibilities. Either the universe began or it's been here forever. Just two possibilities. To get one of them is really not that impressive. Um, <laughs> At least it got it right. Faith and science ought not to conflict if both are means of discovering truth about reality. I think that the impression that there is a conflict has largely arisen because of literalistic interpretations of the opening chapter of the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible. According to modern science, the universe has developed over billions of years. The Bible and Quran seem to describe its creation over a very different time scale, just a matter of days. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light, and there was light, and there was evening and morning the first day. People have taken this to describe six consecutive 24-hour days, and that viewpoint has been exploded by modern science. But it is not a scientific account, and the proof that it isn't is that it gets through creation in 34 verses. That's it, God said, and it was, and now let's move on to what really interests the Bible, which is the human situation. Muslims have no problem with the idea that the universe is 13 to 14 billion years old. And in fact, it enhances our idea of Allah Akbar, God is the greatest. Big Bang cosmology, which is a very persuasive account of the history of the universe, it's certainly not inconsistent with the Genesis story, but the Genesis story is really about theology. The Big Bang is about science. In the Genesis story, it begins by God saying, let there be light. That's a little bit like the Big Bang, but I wouldn't want to overplay that comparison. I think if you said to the writer of uh, Genesis 1, uh, how old is the universe? The writer of Genesis 1 might look at you and say, you've missed the point. The point is, I want you to worship and be excited by this Creator God. If God didn't cause the universe to exist, what did? What science cannot yet do, and one day I think it will have to turn to doing, is thinking about how a universe can come into existence without intervention from absolutely nothing without a creator. And that's going to be really tough for science. There is one answer that appears to avoid this problem. The idea is that the universe could be um, spontaneously created out of nothing. To understand how a universe might be created out of nothing, we must turn to the theory of quantum mechanics. It describes how, in the tiny world of the atom, small particles seem to appear and disappear for no obvious reason. Apparently absurd. Imagine if, in our everyday world, people appeared and disappeared without obvious cause, and yet the theory of quantum mechanics describes how this can happen at the atomic level, and that might offer an alternative to a creator. There is no question that our universe is quantum mechanical. If you ask what caused this universe to pop out, there is no cause, there is just probability for this to happen, and so it happens. But why should a universe as fruitful as ours just pop out of nothing and somehow work? Imagine not just one tiny universe popping into existence, but millions. Imagine that among the millions, one of them by chance had the properties to support life. Maybe that universe was ours. This is the multiverse concept, which suggests that out of millions of possibilities, we by chance are in the one universe that works. The multiverse idea is that there's a universe generating mechanism and it's pop, we get a universe here, and pop, we get a universe there, and Maybe there's an infinite number of them, and all possible universes are 
uh, represented somewhere in this large uh, ensemble. The idea that there might be multiple universes kind of comes out of the idea of quantum mechanics, that things can show up and disappear on very small scales. And so if you have one universe that shows up over here, maybe another one can show up over here. It could be that if a kind of chaotic universe tumbled out of nothing, then it wouldn't survive. It would just collapse back to real nothing. And it may be that our universe happens to be that happy chance of nothing transforming itself into what seems to be something that seems to persist. But still the question remains. Could a universe really come from absolutely nothing? We still have to have uh, some physics we still have to have a universe generating mechanism with all sorts of properties. Uh, we still have to have a means of distributing laws among the universes that get created. The thing is, our horizon for what we can see only encompasses our universe. So if there were another one, or many, the question is how would we see them? We've got many theories of other universes, but we've got no physical evidence at the moment that there are other universes out there. Of course, if you ask, is there evidence that the universe began by this spontaneous nucleation out of nothing, I don't think we can produce any evidence for that. And I think that is possibly an evidence of the desperation of some people, because the multiverse theory has become enormously popular, as if it's either God or a multiverse. They, they forget that it could be both, of course. I don't have a problem whether God has created one universe or millions of universes, or an infinite number, which would be a multiverse theory. Either way, it, it doesn't shake my belief at all that there has to be a unifying principle and uh, a force behind all of this, and that is God. The principle of the multiverse provides at least an interim satisfying explanation in a way that a creator couldn't possibly be a satisfying explanation. Then having got ourselves into a universe which is capable of generating stars, capable of generating chemistry, and ultimately capable of generating <coughs> the origin of life, then biological evolution takes over and now we're, we're on a clear run. The idea of uh, shunting the problem off from the universe to the multiverse, I think, uh, is a fraud. Uh, you can just ask the same question, well, where did all that come from? You really don't explain things just by pushing it off a level. It's, it's just a, a trick. There is much speculation about what caused our universe to exist, but there is consensus that it appears finely tuned to support life, an observation which some argue strengthens the case for a creator and makes it less likely that we are here simply by chance. Things are just right to make possible intelligent life. And over the past 20, 30, 40 years, we've discovered a whole number of very delicate balances within the universe. If you change them by even the tiniest amount, the consequences would be literally lethal. That is, that they would lead to um, very fundamental features of the universe being dramatically transformed in a way that would not permit life. But life does exist because this seemingly endless playground of stars and planets and galaxies is a place of discipline in which there is obedience to a set of laws. We, these little humans on this insignificant planet, are actually are able to discover these laws and to actually understand at least some part of what the universe is doing and why it's doing this. I, I find this to be absolutely astonishing. To support life, the laws of physics must operate with great precision. The law of gravity is so finely balanced that it is powerful enough to hold planets in their orbit, but not so powerful that it prevents us lifting our feet off the ground. By contrast, the law operating in the world of the atom produces forces that are immensely strong. If that force were not that strong, the electrons in your body would just fly away. So it's good for us that the atomic force is strong and the gravitational force is much weaker. We have found even a language, in this case mathematics, 
where we're able to express what the universe is doing and even make predictions. I mean, this is a continuous source of astonishment for me. Every time science makes an advance, we see just how much more wonderful the universe is than we thought. The laws of physics operate across the entire universe. They impact the movement of galaxies. They control events in the minuscule world of the atom. It is these laws that appear to have brought order from disorder. How can their existence be explained? Where do the physical laws themselves come from? Science assumes uh, its own laws, but doesn't explain where they come from. I don't know that I can answer the question why there are laws. Uh, I'm not sure that we will ever be able to answer the question why there are laws. Science proceeds on the basis that the universe is ordered in a rational and intelligible way. It doesn't have to be, but that's the way it is. So it sort of suggests that there is a, a lawmaker, an omnipotent, immutable being who has imposed this order on the universe and presides over it. But some scientists are less convinced about the apparent significance of fine-tuning. So what if the tuning were different? You'll change, of course, the appearance of nature quite a lot, but it, it, it won't automatically rule out the possibility of stars and planets and life and intelligence. Now, I don't see much example of fine-tuning in that sense. There is one thing that seems incredibly well fine-tuned. We're not sure about it, but it, at least it's a candidate for an extreme fine-tuning. There's a quantity called the dark energy. Dark energy, it's an energy, a negative pressure, something that sort of seems to be pulling galaxies away. Observations have shown that we live in a universe where there is a powerful force pushing galaxies apart. Scientists have called this force dark energy. About 73% of the universe is in the form of this dark energy, which we see its effects. It's pushing the expansion of the universe to accelerate, but we really don't have a clue what it is, and we certainly don't see it directly. Using mathematics and their knowledge of physics, scientists calculate that the force of dark energy should be incredibly large. So large that if the dark energy was that large, the universe would have expanded so fast that galaxies and stars could not have formed and there would be no life. The conclusion is that there is a strong counterforce restricting the impact of dark energy to a point where stars and galaxies can form. The precision required appears to be startling. That cancellation has to be accurate to 56 decimal places, at least. According to some, it's 120 decimal places. But whether it's 56 decimal places or 120 decimal places, it's an incredible cancellation. Scientists looking for a chance explanation for such precision return to the concept of the multiverse. With so many potential universes popping into existence, perhaps the conditions have been just right in one of them to have allowed stars and galaxies to form. Maybe one in, a, in every trillion, 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 there's one where the net dark energy, the sum of all the contributions, is small enough to allow the expansion to be slow enough for life to form. The theist, like myself, would say, as we look at the beauty and the elegance of the laws of physics, I think we see something of a creator God. But that revelation is not proof. Each of us can make a judgment on how we interpret that evidence. It's mainstream science. It demands an explanation. And one of the most plausible, in my opinion, the most plausible explanations for the fine tuning of the universe is that there's a fine tuner. The fine tuned nature of the cosmos. It's the only argument that's worth making if you're a theist, in my opinion, the only one. Um, because it is pretty peculiar that the laws of nature are constructed in such a way, not just that you and I could be here, but that any life could be here, that it, that, that it even be atoms, therefore, there could be planets and stars and so on. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's a legitimate mystery. So why is the universe so fine-tuned? Well, we don't know. The answer may be that there is some fundamental principle that we haven't yet glommed on to. One day that principle might be discovered. So meantime, 
isn't using God as an explanation, just filling a gap that in future could be replaced by scientific knowledge, just as happened to the mythological gods of ancient Greece and Rome. Because that god is a sort of Cheshire cat deity who vanishes with the advance of knowledge, always over the next intellectual horizon. And that, of course, can't be the true god. God isn't just lurking in the murky places of the universe, which we don't understand. He's not a god of the gaps. He's the god who created the physical laws, who sustains the physical laws. Without him, the universe would simply not exist. God of the gaps thinking is very dangerous, but to offer us God or science, I think, is very silly. God is the God of the whole show, the one who holds the world in being. It's the whole show, so to speak, the whole panoply of what science does that, for me, is evidence that points towards the creator. We're basically left with three alternatives. Either physical necessity, that is to say, the universe had to be this way. It could not possibly have been any other way. Chance, that is to say it could have existed in different ways, but it's just a lucky accident that the universe is fine-tuned for our existence. Or finally, it's due to design. I must say that I think that the universe does not have a purpose. I mean, I think that the universe emerged from a certain set of laws. So I have this feeling that, you know, once you have these laws, then everything just happens. It happens because it follows these general laws. It's very possible that if those laws weren't there, we wouldn't be here to ask the question. But there is a level beyond which science really cannot answer questions. You might say that the Earth's distance from the sun is fine-tuned to make life possible. It's just random. Out of many billions of planets in the galaxy, some of them are the right distance from their stars. You need a lot of ingenuity to uh, crack the cosmic code, to come to understand these things. Some of the world's most brilliant in intellects are needed uh, to uncover, through science, this uh, deep and subtle order in the universe. And to say that we need brilliant minds to figure out what's going on, uh, but mind doesn't play a part in the structure and origin of that seems to me to be really rather peculiar. In the light of ever-expanding scientific knowledge, the question of whether God's existence is probable, unlikely, or even desirable continues unabated. We've so distorted this debate, ladies and gentlemen, that we feel that it's a debate science versus religion. It isn't that at all. That's clearly so because you see scientists on both sides. The real debate is between atheism and theism. Don't call it by the name they want you to call it. Don't call it intelligent design. It may have been rather crudely designed, but there's nothing intelligent about it. Does nothing strike you as horrible or indecent about the idea of a permanent, unending invigilation and supervision? Round the clock, cradle to the grave, Big Brother is watching you. Someone who can convict you of thought crime while you're asleep. For someone you may not even have known you were going to think. And condemn you utterly for it. Um, and someone who continues this policy after you're dead, where indeed the fun really begins. Ladies and gentlemen, the new atheism is fatally flawed in its attitude to reason, science, history, ethics, and justice. I submit to you it is false. The clerical bullying and the theocratic challenge needs to be met with a very firm and determined reassertion of secularism as a core principle of our democracy and our internationalism. I rest my case for that. I do want to put this to a vote. But I also want to check the don't knows as well. It was Christopher Hitchens that really made me sit up and question absolutely everything. The debate in itself and, and the question post, I think, John Lennox won. I'm still searching in that respect for where I stand. No one else can decide for you. Is the evidence, where does it point, 
Is it enough for me to commit my life and base my life on it? Christians believe in science. Christians believe in a material rea reality. They believe in a law-like nature to existence. They believe that we are discovering God's laws after him. You have to place your bet based on evidence and argument. And evidence and argument really is on the side of people who don't believe in Zeus. And it's likewise on the side of people who don't believe in the God of Abraham. Reluctant as we might be, because it might be unpleasant for us to admit it, although we can't disprove that there's a God, it is very, very unlikely indeed. It's okay to say, I don't know. We don't know yet. I don't know. You don't know. Uh, let's do some more research about that. I think we are the winners in a lottery, and we may feel blessed by that. I think it's grossly premature to conclude that the universe exhibits signs of design. It's really just chance. And I think it's a load of baloney. I think that the, that the universe really is ordered according to mathematics, and that that is a deeply significant fact. Not to be shrugged off as, uh, as a happy accident, not to be explained by saying, well, maybe there are just trillions and trillions of universes that we don't know about, which are all different from ours, and we're just some winning ticket in some uh, multiversal uh, lottery. I would be, I think, ultimately rather pleased that there was a God, because it would mean that I would have another lease of life. I'd very much like to be wrong. Um, I would very much like to be immortal, but I'm afraid uh, <laughs> I don't have any hope that that is the case.